Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on top. I'm really excited about this one. But before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for our speaker, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. And we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Also happening at the end of, the day, of, of today's webinar, we are doing a drawing for four $100 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, with that, let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is Elevate Your Enterprise Python and R AI ML Software Strategy with Anaconda Team Edition. Our speaker today is Michael Grant, who is the VP of Services at Anaconda. Michael, so glad, glad to see you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing some interesting stuff with, with uh, our viewers today. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, I know you have a great presentation on tap, so I'm going to put myself on mute, take myself okay. off camera, and let you get right to it. Great, great. Well, thanks again for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, Again, my name is Michael Grant, VP of Services at Anaconda. And I've got a few different things to talk about today. In fact, I probably have maybe a few more slides than I need, but I'm going to get us out, of, out the door um, at the right time. Um, and let me, let me go over the agenda here. So first, we're gonna we will talk about the Conda Package and Environment Management System. For those of you who are familiar with Anaconda, the Anaconda Distribution, Anaconda Individual Edition, you are likely familiar with using Conda to install packages and manage your Python and R-based data science environments. And I'm gonna give you a, just a brief demo. So if, if you're new to Conda, you'll see why it's a useful tool. And if you are uh, already familiar with Conda, hopefully it won't be too boring. And then we'll talk about, I'm gonna introduce Anaconda Team Edition. Now Anaconda Team Edition is our enterprise package repository for that, you know, for that allow companies to mirror a curated set of the packages in the Anaconda ecosystem into their internal environments. And we'll talk about why that would be a useful thing to do. Um, and we'll give you a little brief overview of what that product looks like. Um, and then we'll go back to sort of talking about practical things. So given that you're you're, you're invested in, in using Conda for package and environment management, given that you're using a repository like Team Edition to manage your packages, how do you manage Conda environments for collaboration and distribution. I have some opinions about that. I'm pretty opinionated about that, and it may be a little bit surprising um, what's, uh, you know, what I would recommend there. And so we'll talk about that. And then we'll actually take a look at a couple of open source software tools that are freely available to make it easier for you to distribute Conda environments to your teams and to your systems and to your clusters and to your applications. And then we'll, and then last but not least, we will we'll do a little bit of a brief look about how Docker and Conda interact with each other and OpenShift as well. So again, we'll have a brief look at that um, so that you can say how I can put Conda environments and use Conda-based Python applications inside Docker containers running on OpenShift, for example, or other Kubernetes platforms. But um, for good reason, we're gonna stick with OpenShift today. So a brief look at that. So let's talk about Conda for a second. Got one slide, then I'm going to go into a little bit of a live demo. So what is Conda? So it's a it is a is a tool for building and maintaining um, in uh, execution environments for Python and R, with a specific focus on numerical computation, analytics, and data science. So some of the things that Conda has going for it is that first of all, it's cross-platform. It's a uh, it runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux, on different variants of Linux. Um, it runs on ZOS. If you bought one of those fancy new um, Apple Silicon Macs, I believe there's a version of Conda for that now, um, and more on the way. Uh, it's also cross-language. It was originally developed by Anaconda to support Python-based data science, but in fact, the Conda package ecosystem 
has um, a lot of R packages in it as well. And actually a number of binary packages and utilities written in other compile languages like Rust and Go. It has rich metadata, which allows, which embeds information about the packages that you're installing. So for example, if, you are, uh, if your company is, very, is a stickler for certain kinds of open source licenses, the, that license information is embedded in the packages and you can filter those out if you need to, if you can, you can avoid installing packages that would violate your policies. And it has a dependency graph. So when I install a package, it will automatically pull in any packages that are needed for it to work properly. And we will see this in action in just a couple of minutes. And it's a binary package format. The packages are pre-compiled. A lot of the packages have, have code, you know, source code in them, but they're pre-compiled so they will run right out of the box. And furthermore, this is a little bit more technical into the weeds. It, we use dynamic linking when linking these different dependent packages together which uh, improves governance and, and ensures cross compatibility. So I won't get too deep into why dynamic linking matters, although if we have time at the Q&A, you wanna talk more about that, feel free to hit me up in the, in the, in the Q&A. All right, so let's get out of this webinar uh, deck here and the team edition, let's minimize that for a second and let's do a demo. So I, I'm, I'm a little ambitious here. I have um, Windows, I have, win, I have Windows on the bottom I have Mac on the top left and I have Unix on the top right. And let's say for the sake of argument that I am an AI ML developer. My favorite deep learning toolkit is PyTorch and I wanna build some Jupyter notebooks that um, run PyTorch. So I know I need the PyTorch package. I know I need matplotlib because that's what I use to plot things with. I need pandas to read my data from disk. It's one of the most popular data packages in the ecosystem. And of course I need Jupyter notebooks. And I want to stay with Python 3.7. I know Python 3.9 just came out and a lot of Python 3.8 packages are out there, but I'm still running Python 3.7, so I want to stick with that. So this is a conda command that creates an environment that includes these packages, okay? Um, so I'm going to run that on the Windows side and the Mac side at the same time. And I've already run it on, on Windows because look, I'll confess the Windows install is a little bit dif different. Um, and so, it, it does, you know, I'm just scrolling up here to show you that the same things happened on Windows here earlier when I ran this demo. So what happened was that Conda took my command that said, please create this environment for me. And it installed all of those packages I asked for, but it installed quite a bit more. Um, and so for example, um, I see that it has, if I scroll up here, I see that it has pandas, which I did ask for, but pandas requires NumPy to run properly. And so here are a couple of NumPy packages that are pulled in. And of course, uh, Python, I asked for Python, but even if I hadn't asked, at least some version of Python would have been pulled in because Pandas requires that. And there are quite a few additional packages, including I might add low level binary packages as well. If I scroll up on the, on the Mac side, you'll see um, similar low level binary packages, but the, the package set's a little bit different on the Mac and it's a, it's a little bit more different, if you will, on the Windows machine as well, because obviously each of these platforms require different low level binaries in order to work. And this is really important um, because by built, by including as much of the binary package, uh, package stack as I need for my tools to run, I'm ensuring that this environment is gonna operate the same on different Linux machines when I move this environment over to a Docker container or when, um, when I deploy it on OpenShift. And so having that binary, it's almost like having the isolation of a Docker container without the expense. So Conda is really powerful in that way. And so then I can, I can activate the PyTorch environment if I want to, um, and I'll do that right now on the Linux side so you can see what happens. And then I'll, I'll open it up. Uh, I can't spell. Okay. And so um, what I will do is I'll show you. Boy, I'm, there we go. So this is a new environment that was created in this directory. I called that, I called it PyTorch. Um, and it has all the packages that I want. And I can actually see for myself what their packages there are by using a command like conda list export. And so this gives me a nice list of the packages that I've installed. And also what you'll see is that it's not just the list of the names of the packages, but also the very precise version and build numbers of the packages. So this is really important because if I'm doing a, a really important analysis and, I, and, and I'm happy with my results, 
I like how the model's running. My model is trained. I'm ready to deploy it to production and I verified it on my local machine. I want to reproduce this compute environment exactly on my production system. And so by having this exact package name, package version and package pair triple, I mean package build triple for all of the packages in, in my environment, I can be sure that when I repro reproduce this environment on a production container that I have everything that I need. Okay, so this is what makes Conda really useful for creating and managing environments that use Python or R for data science, AI, and machine learning applications. So if you're not using Conda yet, if you're not using the Anaconda distribution yet, I strongly recommend that you do so. Um, and, uh, and go check it out on anaconda.com. So I'm gonna pull up the, uh, my presentation a little bit longer, and let's talk about Anaconda Team Edition. Um, so the basic idea is this, if, when I ran those, when I ran those, when that Conda install command, they reached out to the internet and grabbed a bunch of packages from anaconda.org or repo.anaconda.com, our public package repositories. But many of you are working in, in a company that has a strict firewall requirement and they, they might not allow just any package whatsoever to be installed. Um, and so what we, what, so companies that have these kinds of package governance requirements need a repository that allow them to curate and filter the set of packages that they make available to them, uh, that they make available to their users. And so we have such a repository. You may have heard of others out there in, in the world, but we have one called Anaconda Team Edition that is optimized for the data, data science applications. So I'm gonna pull up a uh, Anaconda Team Edition window and so this is what it would look like if you go to your internal repository. Mine happens to be called, well, demo.teamedition. And I can search for individual packages that I might want, okay? And so these are public packages. And you'll notice I haven't logged in yet. Um, I can look for, you can see matplotlib and I can get more information about it if I want to. Um, and, but if I log in, I get a little bit different. So here's what it looks like when I log in as a user. And I see a dashboard of some activity that's happened on the repository. And you can see there are multiple channels of packages, including one of my own called mgrant. Um, and there are also CVEs, which we're gonna talk about later. Um, and so what I can do, if I go to my channel, what this allows me to do uh, is, uh, is to, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to go to condomain here. Um, let me pull this one up here. Where do I find it? So what, what it allows me to, what, what Anaconda Team Edition allows me to do is, is to create a mirror of packages of, uh, I, let me back up a little bit. It allows me to, to mirror a subset of the packages that we host at um, Anaconda on, um, you know, on the local copy of the repository. Okay, so, what the, so basically the, your company can block Anaconda on your firewall, but then download all the packages that you want and then, and then point all of your Conda users to your internal repository. And one of the most important things about Anaconda Team Edition is that it not only has the ability to mirror the packages themselves, but information about the vulnerabilities in the packages. So that's where we get to the CVEs, okay? So obviously it makes sense that you want to avoid using packages, certainly in user fa or customer facing applications or public applications, that have known security vulnerabilities in them. And the National Institute of Standards and Technology publishes a feed of comments of packages, uh, uh, excuse me, it uh, publishes a feed of known security vulnerabilities that you can learn about, um, I mean, by going to their website. But here's a problem. How do I match those, this long database of vulnerabilities to packages that I'm actually using? And this is something that Anaconda Team Edition does for me. And so, for example, um, I, what I've done here is I've gone to the Jinja 2 package, which is a really common library for templating in Python. And I will see that certain versions of Jinja, particularly 2.10, um, have, 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 has a known high security vulnerability in it. And it's got a CVSS3 score of 9.8, it's a critical threat. So we don't really want to have that package in my you know, in my repository. So we might, if I'm a company, I probably want to remove this version of the package from the repository. And thankfully, um, newer versions of the of the package have solved that vulnerability and that vulnerability no longer applies to that package. 
so it's safe to use, or at least it's safe from that particular vulnerability. Okay, so so knowing what these vulnerabilities are is really important, especially if you're an IT organization in say uh, a fintech company or a healthcare company where the security of your data is paramount. Um, when you're doing interactive data science on your personal desktop, sometimes these things don't matter as much. And so the point is that you can decide for yourself what your security profile is and make decisions based on that. So let me go back to my demo really quick on Linux, and I'm gonna take a look at um, the Jinja 2 version that I included in, uh, in, in my environment. Now, I didn't actually ask for Jinja 2, okay? If you'll see, this is the command I used to create my environment. I didn't ask for Jinja 2, but the reason that it was installed is that it is a dependency of the Jupyter Notebook and, uh, application. So it was pulled in even though I didn't ask for it, which is why it's really important to know, you know to be able to easily find out if you are using a vulnerable package or not. And sure enough, um, I am using a version of, of, uh, of Jinja 2 that is uh, questionable. And so what I can do is I can actually I can actually update it by say using 2.11 of Jinja instead or greater. So I can actually use a version constraint and I can install that into the into my environment. And once this conda command is done, it will have updated Jinja to a newer version. And if we look at say version 2.11 in here, we find that there's no security vulnerabilities in Jinja 2.2.11 that are known about yet. Right, and so as soon as this is done, oop, and I will just go ahead and update it. Now, boom, I've resolved the security vulnerability in my environment. Okay, so that's a really nice feature of Anaconda Team Edition, and specifically the service that we provide of taking the CVEs that are publicly available, so you can go find them yourself, but matching them up to the packages in in our repository, and also scrubbing them and making sure that they that they're correct. And so this gets back to, to get back to my presentation, go back to that. That actually um, is an important point to make here, which is that it's not enough to just get the raw database. Okay, and let's talk about what we do to make sure that the raw vulnerability information is useful to our users and to our customers. Um, so, uh, first of all, that we we grab the pat we grab the the raw CBE data from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And these are submitted by security researchers and developers from all over the world. So it's not the responsibility of NIST alone to, to populate this database. They are just a clearinghouse for all this vulnerability matching. And then what we do, and actually, frankly, what a lot of open source tools do in the, it, that you can find on your own, and even some commercial tools do, is automatically match the CVE data in the database to the packages in your repository. But where we go further than that is in the human curation. We review and we review that data for accuracy and then categorize, categorize, refine, and improve that information. And then in some cases, if the package is a particularly critical part of the ecosystem, we will actually patch the package so that it um, so that, that vulnerability is resolved. And then we can add the fact that we've done so into the CVE data so that Anaconda Team Edition can let you know that we have resolved that vulnerability. And then that refined metadata is actually what is delivered to Team Edition. So this is what the raw data looks like here. So this is a really interesting example. So this is a CVE from 2014. And it, with the raw CVE data on the left, this is what came right from NIST, says that this applies to every single version of Python in existence. That's what the CVE data claims. But when you do a dive into the actual text, of the CVE, what you find is that this actual this vulnerability actually applies to just one particular library called Rope. This is not a, a, a part of the Python standard library. It's a separate package that you would have to explicitly install. So Python is not actually vulnerable to, uh, uh, um, to the CVE. I mean, the CVE does not actually apply to Python, even though the NIST metadata says it does. Furthermore, newer versions of the rope library have corrected this vulnerability so the true answer to this question is that only versions of rope older than 0.11 are vulnerable to this bug or to this vulnerability and our curated metadata includes that correction so if you're looking at rope or you're looking at python on team edition you will find that this uh, this updated information is applied 
and that valid versions of Rope and Python are exempt from this vulnerability. So this is a service we provide on top of the raw database matching and why the team edition data feed is important if security vulnerabilities are an important part of your governance workflow. Okay, so I that that's all I'm going to say about uh, Anaconda team edition, although I'm happy to answer more questions about that in Q&A. But now let's talk, I want to go to the next level. So team edition is great for managing packages on bringing in um, your, all of the conda packages that your team needs to do AI and ML and data science work. So whether it's Python or PyTorch and all of the dependencies that are involved in all of that, um, including GPU accelerated versions of those libraries or, um, or anything else that you might need. But packages are only part of the story. The first thing that I did in my live demo was create an environment that combined all of those packages together into a single well, into a single environment that works you know, that 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 is designed to work together. So, if you want to manage packages well, you can use something like Team Edition or another repository product. But really, if you're going to manage, if you want to help your data science team succeed, I make the argument that you need to manage environments. Now, Conda is great because you can actually install whatever package you want, and you can mix and match your environment and totally customize it to your precise application. And if you're an individual data science data scientists that might be very tempting but i would like to advocate if you have a team maybe you're an individual data science that works with a large team maybe you are a manager or an administrator that serves larger teams i strongly encourage you to all standardize your environment to try to the extent possible use the exact same environment across all of your your computer so you know your entire team is using the same version of python the same version of Pandas, the same version of TensorFlow, and so forth and so on. So why would I want to do that? When Conda is so flexible, why would I turn around and tell you not to use that flexibility? Well, there are some strong reasons for that. First of all, it reduces your support burden. If you're if you're supporting that team, then then you only have to answer questions about the surface area of the of the environment itself, and not all of the individual packages that your team might be using. And furthermore, you can evaluate new packages as, as they come in to make sure they're mature enough, that they're stable enough, that they're widely adopted. You, you don't wanna have to support the pack, some package that somebody on Hacker News just reported about that an academic you know, at a very fine university, but as soon as they're done with grad school, isn't gonna maintain anymore. You know, and so you, you get to evaluate whether or not this is a tool that ought to be used in your business critical applications. It encourages collaboration. If everyone is using a common package set, then when, when, when person A delivers a model over to person B for evaluation, they know that it's going to run on the desktop, you know, on person B's desktop. So common tool choices make it easier for people to help each other and to collaborate with each other and work with each other. It also, also ensures portability and deployability. So, you know, again, I ran that same Conda, uh, Conda command across Windows, Mac, and Linux. And if I could take a little more effort to refine the versions of those top-level packages that I'm using, then I, it's actually feasible for people to collaborate across platforms. I can often deliver models from Linux to Windows and vice versa, for example, with high confidence that they will actually be compatible with each other. Um, furthermore, um, if I know I'm going to deployment, I might have a tighter set of requirements for deployment uh, into production than I do in development. So then what I want to do is I want to build the, the uh, that I might need to instantiate the production environment on my local desktop machine, verify my model operates properly in production. And once I've verified it there on the desktop, because of Conda's ability to precisely reproduce environments from platform to platform, I can make sure then that model is going to go into production and work properly. Okay. And so all that said, I'm not saying that you shouldn't enable your data scientists to customize their content environments, but I am telling you, if you once you start working with a team of a larger group, the the standardizing on at the very least on the versions of the top level packages that everyone is using is really important for collaboration. And I strongly encourage it. And so and and for but one nice thing is that there one size doesn't fit all and that that so what i'm not saying is that you should just have one environment that everybody uses you have different applications you have different purposes so be feel free to define multiple standard environments so for example you might have a standard python 3 based environment that has all of the preferred data science tools 
for your team, you might have some leg legacy applications that are using Python 2. And I do hope you're not using Python 2 for new applications. Uh, you, you might have an R environment. Some of you are R users. Uh, you can have an R environment that's separate from your Python environment, or you can mix them together. You might have GPU machines that you need to run on. So you might have a GPU enabled version that use your TensorFlow on your Mac might not be CPU driven, but then you might be using a Linux based machine with GPUs that has a GPU enabled version of the same environment. So the point is, we're not saying standardize on one environment, you can standardize an entire family. And then finally, destinations. Again, one of the things that I said about uh, Conda is that it's portable and that it makes it possible for you to, um, uh, to deliver environments to a variety of different locations. Obviously, desktop users have a solution whether they're running Windows, Mac, and Linux. If you have edge nodes on your cluster, you can install them there. JupyterHub is a popular collaborative development tool that can accept Conda environments. We at Anaconda have our own Anaconda Enterprise development platform that you can that these um, that uses Conda environments under the hood. Lots of third-party platforms do. Point is, there are a lot of places where these environments can go. Right, and that's a segue to my next topic, which is how do I do that? So I am going to skip ahead here. Um, let me just say this: that it's a really good idea when you are standardizing environments to use a versioning process, where each of your environments are versioned and archived so that if you need to go back and reproduce a model with an older version of environment, you can do that. But now that I, if let's say for the sake of argument, you believe me, that we need to standardize our content environments or at least give people out of the gate um, a standard set of environments to begin from that they can build upon, how do I distribute those content environments throughout my organization? So there are two tools to do that that are open source, freely available at the end of this webinar. I'm gonna give you links to their re, uh, GitHub repos. Um, and not surprisingly, you can Conda install both of these into Conda environments and use them there. One is called Constructor and one is called Conda Pack. Um, and so uh, the, these are two freely available open source tools, the Construct available for you that allow you to build and distribute Conda environments for different applications. So Constructor is user friend, builds user-friendly custom installers similar to the Anaconda and Miniconda installers you might already be using. So they're on the Mac and, the, and, and Windows, you get this nice GUI on Linux and actually on the Mac as well, you can use a shell script based installer. Now Conda Pack is a little bit different. Conda Pack are simple compact archives, basically using a standard tarball format um, for lower, that, 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 that's better for lower level automated approaches for distributing environments across say a cluster, for example. Um, and so both of these tools have different purposes. And so both of them are useful for taking environments that you've curated and designed and turning them into solutions that your users can use. So Constructor is the tool for building custom installers uh, you know, that you can distribute to individual users. There's lots of ways to customize these with custom package sets, uh, Conda configuration settings. You can even have add your company logo or branding at the top of the installer. So now you can, instead of looking like an Anaconda installer, it can look like your company's installer. Um, so you can, you don't have to use the same packages that we use at Anaconda, you can mix and match. Um, so the way it works, and I'm gonna actually show you, I'm not gonna do a live demo in the interest of time, but I'm, it's a pseudo live demo, I ran it before we started this. Um, there's a particular file that you need to create called construct.yaml that describes what packages you want. And one file can apply to Windows, Mac, and Linux, which is great because again, as I talked about before, you know, if you if you pin down the top level versions of your packages, you often get portability between Windows, Mac, and Linux of your applications. So building a constructor that standardizes environments across OSs is really nice. It calls Conda to figure out what, it, what packages you need, downloads those packages, and then combines them into standard installers. Um, so Windows, you, you're probably, you've probably seen these installer types before in, in real life. And so the results look somewhat like this. On the, on the Windows, on a Windows machine, you get, um, the, you get an installer that looks like on the bottom left. Um, on, the, on the top right, there's a Mac, you know, a, a standard natural Mac UI to the UI based installer. But on Linux and Mac as well, there's a, there's a shell script. It's actually really rather interesting. It embeds the binary package data inside the shell script and the shell script extracts that binary blob and unpacks it and installs it in the location that you want. 
Um, and so if I if I quit out of here real quickly, and I can actually uh, drop down and show you what I'm talking about. So I have just an example here of what these uh, constructor files look like. And um, so here's on Linux and, and the Mac again. And then I believe I've got even one on Windows. So let me pull that up. I do indeed. So in all three of these cases, you'll see I've got the exact same uh, construct.yaml file. I've called it sorta conda. And I've got, and I won't go through all the, the details, but there's lots of customizations that let you point these installers to your internal repositories and and to set it up so that that's ready to connect to that but i it's this is a really simple um, installer that includes python and conda and then the anaconda distribution which is a curated set of packages for data science that we offer so there'll be about it'll be a couple hundred packages in here when all is said and done um, and so this you know so then you run constructor and when all is said and done this is what you get you get I'm just gonna take a look. I've got a shell script over here. Um, I have both the shell script and a GUI installer on the Mac, and then I have an executable on Windows. So if I open up this, if I open this uh, GUI installer on the Mac, for example, it's gonna come up on the wrong window, so I'll have to drag it over here, and you can see that um, it's a pretty easy installer. Okay, and so I can select the destination. I can customize whether I install it, whether I, you know, add content is it conda initialization to my bash script and so forth okay so constructor is a great way for you as an administrator or as a team lead or anything else um, for you to um, uh, for you to, to distribute the packages that your team needs to be productive okay and uh, well I, again I, I, I suppose I didn't need to show you that in the script but um, that's constructor uh, Conda Pack, again, I mentioned earlier, is a lower level tool. So the basic idea is this. I'd like to be able to, you know, you would think that I, I create a Conda environment on my Linux machine. I could just tar it up into a tarball or a zip file, and I could give it to somebody else, and they could just unpack it, and it would work, right? But unfortunately, that's not the case. Conda environments are not relocatable. So moving a Conda environment, even on the same machine, to a different directory can actually break it. And the reason for that is, honestly, it's not Conda's fault, please don't blame us, but the actual packages themselves often depend on knowing exactly where they, in, they are installed. And so what Conda does when it's actually building an environment out for you is it actually adjusts, it employs special logic to adjust the packages as they are being installed so they know where they're installed and they can operate correctly. So for it to get down into the weeds a little bit, we might have to adjust our pass or DL, DLL pass for shell scripts. We, we might have to sh uh, adjust the shebang scripts. None of that means anything to you that's okay, but the point is we fix the problems that prevent um, an, an environment from being relocatable. But again, it's it's been tuned to work in that exact location where you installed it. So you can't just tar it up and move it somewhere else. So what Condapack does is effectively reproduce that relocation logic for you so that you can indeed take that tarball give it to somebody or autom in an automated manner, distribute it to other locations, unpack the tarball and run the relocation logic in the new location if you need to. So this is, you know, so, so this solves that fundamental problem of distributing Conda environments. Um, and we've recently added the ability to natively build Cloudera parcels to this Conda pack, uh, to the Conda pack um, utility. So that's a great way to distribute Conda environments to your Cloudera uh, cluster for PySpark jobs, for example. Um, the, you know, it's a, it's a shell script. It's a shell script tool, whether you're on Windows, Mac, or Linux. Um, and it's as simple as saying Conda pack in the name of the environment. And there's some options for you to change them out. Uh, I mean, to, to modify the environment. If you know the directory that the environment that the environment is going to like in the in the case of a cloudera parcel you actually already know where it's going to live on the destination machine you can specify that and the relocation work will be done in advance so that you can just untar the the archive and be done with it so if the destination is known that's a really useful thing to do you can exclude or re-include files based on a simple pattern matching capability so it's a pretty powerful little tool um, and again as i mentioned uh, the parcel support was recently added, and that's something that a lot of our customers were really asking for. So this is a nice low-level tool for distributing Conda environments across destinations. 
This is what it looks like. And again, I'm not going to go to a live demo, but at the top of this example, we do just type Conda Pack in the name of the environment. I created a tarball. I unpacked it into a different location. Um, and I, uh, I mean, I can unpack it into a different location, but I actually, in this case, I'm sorry, I actually have a couple of different examples. In the second example here, I'm un unpacking it into a zip format. And in the third example, I'm packing it into a parcel format. Um, and then unpacking is really easy. You deliver the archive to the destination and unpack it, and then you activate it and run a relocation script if you haven't already done, if, if you haven't already run the relocation. So it's a really easy thing to do and distribute. Um, so this is what it looks like to unpack. I put it into a new location. I activate the environment and run the Conda unpack script. And I get the same set of packages in a functional form that were in my source repository or my source environment. And that's Conda pack. Now, in the last few minutes, and I'm going to go a little bit long, I was trying to wrap up by 1240, but I'm going to go just a couple more minutes to talk about using Conda with Docker. So this would be a really, this would be another great way to distribute Conda environments in a reproducible way. Embed them into a Docker container, and then you can build additional applications on top, you know, as additional layers in the Docker container if you'd like, right? Um, you can schedule these containers to run on OpenShift. And so if when you do when you're running Docker containers on OpenShift, there are a couple of, of generic concerns that I think anyone with experience on OpenShift is probably aware of um, that you need to you need to be aware of, and specifically the fact that you won't necessarily be able to control what UID, what user the container is running as. So you have to take some steps to make sure that everything you install into the container is accessible as any UID. Now, OpenShift by default will assign the, the running user group ID zero, the root group. So it has so anything that's group writable by the root group is visible, but you just have to be very explicit and careful when building your Docker containers that that is the case. And also we, I, we find that some utilities actually get confused when OpenShift runs um, an application as a UID that doesn't exist in the password file because it doesn't have a username associated with that user. And so we use, I've, I use the NSS wrapper utility to set that username so that that application is not confused. Um, now, of course, then the fundamental challenge is how do I build the Conda environment within the container? And then how do I, and, and then Conda environments need to be activated. You need to actually tell Conda to put the Conda environment onto the path. How do I do that in the Docker container itself? So what I've done actually is I built and um, I, I built a, uh, a, a tool that does this. Let's take a look. Um, I, it's actually a, a, a repo that I'm, I've got a link that I'm going to be sharing with you in my wrap-up slide that includes a Docker file. We'll take a look at that here now. Um, and then an entry point. And so I invite you to grab this and use it as a pattern. Start from, you know, start here and build your Docker containers using techniques like this. You don't need to credit me. You can modify it all you want, file an issue if you want to recommend something for everybody else to share. So let me just walk you through this really quickly. I'm going to, I'm going to expand the font size a little bit for my own eyeballs. Um, we start out, we're using a Red Hat universal base image. Um, and then I create my, my non-root user. So I'm doing everything I can as UID 1001. This root user will have group ID 0. But again, it's important to remember, OpenShift won't necessarily run this container as, as user 1001. So we're gonna have to, we'll see at the entry, in the entry point what we do about that. So I copy the entry point in here and then the environment TXT file actually tells me what packages I wanna install. And then here are some simple commands that download a special uh, miniature standalone executable version of Conda that lives just long enough for me to create the exact Conda environment I'm interested in. And then I activate it and I set some settings. And then here's the, here's the key point, I make sure that this, I installed Conda, I installed my Conda environment into user local. I need to make sure that it's group writable so that no matter what UID OpenShift chooses to run it as, it can run successfully. And then I tell Docker that the entry point is given by this entry point uh, script. So what is that entry point script? Really pretty simple. So the first thing I do is I look for the UID in, that, that it's running as, and if it's not in the password file, which is almost certain to be true for um, OpenShift, I use the NSS wrapper package to basically, um, well, what's the right way to describe it? It basically fakes your application out 
by giving it a username uh, it knows about. Okay, so this is a technique that you can look at this Red Hat article to understand why this is uh, a worthwhile approach. In the past, what people used to do is actually add the new user to the password file. It turns out that that is a vulnerability vector, a vector for security escalation. You don't want to use that. Use NSS wrapper instead. So use this as, um, you know, as a pattern. Um, and then down here, I set some important and useful environment variables. I activate the conda environment, and then I run the command. And I put some fancy prints in here just for debugging and explanation purposes, okay? So this is a nice generic entry point to be perfectly example, to be perfectly frank, that you can use to build upon that accomplishes a couple of the key um, needs when running conda inside OpenShift. Number one, making sure that you can handle whatever UID you throw at it. And number two, making sure that your conda environment is fully activated so that it's ready to execute an application inside the Docker container. Um, in fact, I believe I have up, up here, um, let's see, in this thing here, I have this Docker container. Let's see, let's see if I've got a Docker run. Uh, let's see, there we go. Let's do, the, let's do this right here. Let's run it real quick. Okay, so this is an example of this very Docker container running. It's it's actually running as UID 1001, so I didn't have to do any fancy, fancy username munging, but I can actually see that my conda environment is activated and I can open it up and see that I am indeed in the locally installed version of Python. Okay, so that's my Docker container in operation. So I know that's a brief overview, but again, it's my hope that this repository here is a is a nice tool for you to use to build upon um, OpenShift friendly UBI based Docker containers running Conda. Okay, um, and with that, I'm going to go back to the presentation, wrapping up, giving you some action action items, and we'll go right to Q and A. First of all, if you don't know Conda, if you haven't used Conda, this is your first real exposure to it please start doing so. Go to anaconda.com, download individual edition, check it out. We've got a tutorial for you there uh, to, to help you get started um, once you've downloaded individual edition. So if you don't know Conda, I'm assuming many of you have, I hope many of you have, but if not, there's that anaconda.com is your answer. Um, go check out Constructor and Conda Pack. Here are the URLs for that. Um, if you need to build GUI based installers, Constructor is your answer, or if you know, like the user friendly installers. If you need to do automated environment distribution across a cluster, Conda Pack is a great choice. Um, and then uh, here's the URL for my simple Docker demo. Okay, MCG1969 is my very unoriginal GitHub username, and webinar Docker is the name of the repo that I built. I literally pushed that up last night at one in the morning. So um, again, if you have any questions, actually file an issue on that. If you have questions about any piece of that um, repo, I am happy to answer questions. And with that, let's take questions here right now. Um, and I think, I believe we were instructed to put them up on the chat and yeah. I'm, ready to, I'm ready to go. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, yes, guys, there is plenty of time for question and answer period. If you have a question for Michael, go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel and we will uh, dive right into what we've got so far. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, here's one for you. If my okay. company already has Artifactory, do we need Team Edition? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so Artifactory, for those of you who may not know, Artifactory is another repository product. It actually has really wide coverage. It handles lots of different package ecosystems, not just Conda. Um, and team in uh, not just Python and R, but NPM and Java, and Maven, and all sorts of other assets. So a lot of companies already have Artifactory. And the short answer to the question is that if your company is already comfortable with Artifactory, you don't necessarily need Team Edition. However, our CDE feed is really important to a lot of our customers to make sure that they know that the packages they're receiving from us are secure. And Artifactory doesn't bring in that CDE information, that security vulnerability information. So if that's an important part of your workflow, then you would want to talk to us about Team Edition. That is something that differentiates Artifactory. Um, one other thing is that the ability in Anaconda Team Edition to create uh, multiple channels of Conda packages for different applications and different projects, that tends to be something that's easier for to do in Team Edition than in Artifactory, at least from my understanding of the product. 
And so you may find that if your group likes to build a lot of Conda channels for particular projects or groups or applications, that team edition may be a better fit. But again, I do wanna say that if your primary interest is simply receiving our curated package set from us, then you may not need team edition. It might be that our commercial edition offering is a better choice. All right, great. Uh, let's see, here's another question for you. I just connect directly to Anaconda to get my packages. Mm -hmm. So why would I need team edition? Um, Another good question. I, we, there's a partial answer that you know in the last in the last question that um, you you know it's uh, well first of all that means your IT department hasn't blocked Anaconda on the firewall. If you have control over the firewall, then we're probably done. But don't be surprised if in a couple of months they discover there's a lot of traffic going to Anaconda.com, a website they may not know about, and suddenly you're having trouble accessing it. We do have this problem with many of our customers. They email or your users they email support and saying. I can't access Anaconda, can you help me? And it turns out it's it's the problems on their end. Um, so just so you know that, that that's a potential problem that could come up. And having a repository on site like Team Edition lets you grab all the packages you need once and, and, and use them as much as you want internally. Not only that, your IT department may, may actually like this because they can open a hole in the firewall just for Team Edition to grab the trusted packages and then close it off for everybody else. And that gives them a sense of control that they need. But the truth of the matter is, if you don't need the CVEs, if you don't need the security vulnerability information, and you don't need that firewall solution, then you may not need Team Edition, and you should feel free to continue using Anaconda directly. Okay, all right, great. Guys, plenty of time for question and answer period, so if you do have one, go ahead and get it in. I have one more here for you, Michael. Uh, okay. We just use uh, PIP, PIP, to install Python packages. Do I still need Conda? Oh, um, well, define need. So this, the, you know, there, uh, <laughs> if you if you've been around the Python ecosystem long enough, you know that there are strong opinions, um, and there are some people that actually don't like Conda that like to actually prefer to use nothing but PIP. Let me make a, let me offer a couple of reasons why I genuinely believe, and I'm saying this as an engineer, as a user. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was a heavy user of Conda before I joined Anaconda. Um, why? A cond is a better solution. First of all, um, PIP was designed only for Python packages. And so uh, so if I wanted to build environments for R, I can't use PIP. I need to, you know, CRAN is the equivalent in the R ecosystem. But with Conda, I can use both. Um, uh, also, PIP doesn't do as good a job with packages that have a lot of binary dependencies. PIP was not defined, was not designed originally to handle binary dependencies. And the solution that, that the PIP community has developed, and it's not bad, is called PIP wheels. And those wheels embed the binary libraries inside the packages themselves. This is a problem for a couple of reasons. Number one, from a governance point of view, I may not know what binaries are inside the wheels I'm installing. So I think I'm installing pandas, but I'm actually installing pandas and a bunch of numerical libraries that might have security vulnerabilities in them. I might be installing um, a, 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 the pillow library, for example, for image processing. And those image processing libraries often have security vulnerabilities, and I might not even know that they are embedded inside the pillow wheel. With Conda, the pillow package doesn't include the libraries themselves. It actually, it actually links to them by, with metadata, and then Conda pulls in the GIF, the, the GIF library and the JPEG library and the PNG library. So now when I'm studying the security surface of my environment, I know that I have the JPEG library and the PNG library, and I know exactly what versions of those libraries I have. Um, and then uh, honestly, the inclusion of those binary libraries does come with some, sometimes causes conflicts between wheels that you install in the same environment. So um, I argue that Conda is generally a better solution, especially in the data science space when there's so many binary packages. But if you get by with just PIP alone, I think that's fine, but I do think, again, I would really recommend you check out Conda. All right, great. Uh, here's a question for you. Can you use Conda for any type of development in Python? I teach SDET skills, software development education training, in, in oh. Python, and this would be great for maybe getting students set up quickly in any environment. Sure, that's a, that's a great question. The short answer to this question is yes, absolutely. You can, uh, Python, uh, Conda is not just for data science alone. It's not just for, 
even if I broaden that a bit to say data engineering or numerical analysis or any sort of comp computational math, it's great for all of those things and it was designed for that, but it's a very generic package manager. And um, you can, any, the question really boils down to have the, are the pa Python packages you using, have they been built by the Conda, have they been turned into Conda packages yet by the Conda packaging team? There are hundreds of Python packages available in our repository. There are thousands available in the Conda Forge community maintained repository, and they cover loads of applications. Um, <clears throat> for example, if you're a Django developer, there are quite a few Django uh, packages available in the Conda Forge repository. So yes, you can use Py you can use Conda for just about any application. And so let's say you're you're an instructor, you could build uh, you you could use the you could use the constructor package to build a special installer for your students that has exactly the set of packages that they want that you want them to have for your class. And you can say just install this version of Python on your computer on your Windows machine or your Mac or your Linux machine, and you'll have everything you need for your course. So I think that would be a really useful application for Conda and Constructor. Excellent. All right. Well, it looks like those are all of the questions that we have. Oh, actually, yep, yep. Those are all the questions that have come in so far. Um, there's still a couple minutes, though. If anybody has any more questions, they want to go ahead and ask Michael, please go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel. Mm -hmm. I'll keep an eye on the queue here as they come in. And while we are waiting to see if any uh, more do come in, just a quick reminder to the audience that today's event has been recorded. Uh, so if you missed any uh, of or all of the webinar, or if you just want to watch it again, um, you can do so. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website. So you can always go look for it there. You can just go to DevOps, DevOps.com slash webinars look in the on-demand section and it should be right there waiting for you. <clears throat> okay, excuse me. Still uh, no additional questions that have come in. So um, I guess I'll go ahead and close out the question and answer period. If uh, if you do have a question, please, you know, go ahead and get it in. I can always slip it in right before we close out the webinar. Um, but uh, um, uh, what else, what else, what else, what else? So I do need to uh, let everybody know, uh, let you know about the webinar being available on demand. Uh, oh, we have, a, we have a drawing for four $100 Amazon gift cards. How could I forget that? Oh my gosh. Okay, all right. So, so without further ado, let's go ahead and do the drawing. And then if we do have any final questions, we'll go through those. Okay, our first winner today is Angel W. Congratulations, Angel. Second hey, winner today. And a, and, a, and a question asker too, even better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, totally unrelated, totally unrelated. So uh, next question is, or next next winner is Brittany B. Congratulations, Brittany. Our third winner today is James B. Congratulations. And our fourth and final winner today is uh, Valerie D. Congratulations, Valerie. And uh, we'll be following up uh, with uh, with you guys to get your Amazon gift card over to you. So um, please check your inbox. And uh, if you don't see anything in your inbox, please check your spam folder. Well, Michael, I haven't seen any more questions come through. So I guess I guess that's it. You had so much information in your webinar <laughs> that you answered everybody's questions. So that's that's, I I that's actually a really good thing. <laughs> I try to pack well, it in. I, I, you know, I hope I can be helpful for people. So yeah, yeah. Well, so if anybody does have a question following the webinar, can they reach out to you directly? Is there a way to get in touch with you? Oh, I'm more than happy to. And I, I would say the best way, especially for the Docker container, is um, over uh, the GitHub repo that I that I posted. And we're going to be sharing a copy of the presentation slides. And I will mm -hmm. put recommended contact information on that last slide before I share that with you. Awesome. 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 Okay. All right. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Michael, for a great presentation. Lots of great stuff. And I'm a big fan of the demos. So I love watching the demos. So thank you so much. I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. Uh, this is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off today. Have a great day, everybody. Enjoy your evening. And above all, please stay safe. <laughs>